We have been uh, looking at the life of Abraham, but I want to remind you, I'm not going through the life of Abraham in order to to teach all of the things that took place in his life. In fact, uh, I'm skipping a lot of, of the things that happened in Abraham's life. What we're looking at in Abraham's life is we're looking at the grand scheme of, of what God is doing as far as saving lost mankind and, and the role that he, God, has Abraham play in that. And so what we saw a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, is we saw, first of all, faith called. God called into the town of Haran. He called Abraham and said, come out. And so Abraham came out. The faith, the faith, it, 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 it happened at the time of the call. Abraham wasn't looking for God. Abraham didn't have an epiphany and suddenly go, I think I want to find God. But God's voice called into the Mesopotamia Valley, into a particular town where Abraham was living. And when God's voice called, the Bible says that Abraham came out, that Abraham heard the voice of God and he obeyed. Faith was begun. And then we saw the failures. We saw some of the failures. There's going to be more failures in Abraham's life. But when he gets to the place where God has decided Abraham should be, do you remember there was a severe famine in the land? And without asking God anything, Abraham figures out a plan. Abraham implements the plan. and Abraham leaves the place where God has called him. He does not trust in God's provision. And he goes to Egypt and he gets in trouble there. And the next thing you know, Egypt kicks Abraham out. I think, I think that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have a true saving faith and you lose your way and you get find yourself suddenly back in the world, the world can't stomach you. You're sick being there and they're sick having you. Praise God, he eventually has them kick us out and we find ourselves back where we're supposed to be. And then we saw that Lot had been captured, and Abraham goes with his three Amorite chieftain friends. And they go to war, and they win. And when Abraham comes back, God has this priest and king meet Abraham on the way, and the priest, speaking on behalf of God, says, Blessed be Abraham of God. And you remember last week we saw this friendship that the Bible says in three places of Abraham that he was God's friend. And we see Abraham respond. The king of Sodom, the king, this king of the world wants to give Abraham all of this stuff. And Abraham says, I want nothing from you because then you'll say that you made me rich. And that's not the truth. God made me rich. And that's where we left off last week. And I want to pick up there and, uh, and, and in the story. And there are two points to today's message that I want to make sure that you get. So let us pick up in Genesis, please. <clears throat> Chapter 15. Where we left off last week, where Abraham takes a tithe and gives it to God. And in doing this, he's saying, I know that God is the one who gave me the victory. In addition to that, he refuses what the king of Sodom offers him for the sake of God's name. And he says, my three chieftain friends here, remember Mamre and his two brothers, let them have their share these chieftains of the Amorites. After these things is where we pick up. After these things, Genesis 15, 1, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. I want to make sure you get this. Abraham suddenly finds himself in a vision. You guys remember one day Peter, when he's on the roof, a vision comes down. God's communicating to Peter through a vision with Ezekiel. There's visions. God picks him up by the hair and takes him places and shows him stuff. John is picked up and caught into heaven. That many times God communicates in visions. 
And in the vision, God speaks to Abraham and says, Do not fear, Abraham, I am a shield to you, and your reward shall be very great. Reward for what? What has Abraham done? Well, he answered the call in faith. And he failed. And after he failed, he came back to God and began to call on the name of the Lord again after his failure. And he went to war. And when he went to war and he came back, he gave God his due. He gave God his appreciation. He gave God the top, the best. And then he refused what the world was offering. And so he receives a reward from God. Do not fear, Abraham. I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be great. Abraham has a concern, though. And since God's talking, and I've done this myself before, if God's talking to me and I've had something that's been on my mind for a while, well, as long as I've got your attention, can we talk about my wife? Or whatever it might be, right? How many points did I just lose there, guys? <laughs> okay. Abraham said, Oh, Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Now remember, Abraham is in a vision. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he, God, in this vision, took him outside. Would any of you like to have that happen? Wouldn't you love for God to come and say, I want to show you something. Come with me, and suddenly you're outside. Wouldn't you like that? Abraham had that. For me, I just want to say, I can think of no greater reward. If you walk with God, guess what you have? A walk with God. Guess who's there with you while you're walking? God. Why? Because you're walking with God. What greater reward? Isn't that why you walk with God? So that you can be where God is? And he says, uh, look up at the stars if you are able to count them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. And then he believed in the Lord. And he, meaning the Lord, reckoned it to him as righteousness. Let us consider that for a moment. I'm going to share a couple of passages of Scripture from the New Testament, but I just want us to pause for a moment. In the vision, God takes Abraham outside and shows him the sky. How many of you have ever gone out maybe five or ten miles outside of El Paso into the desert at night? And what you do is you turn off your lights and you close your eyes for five, maybe ten minutes. If you have a pickup truck, you just lay in the truck bed. And you, you keep your eyes closed for maybe five or ten minutes. And when you open your eyes, you will see the sky as you have never seen it before. That's how Abraham saw the sky that night. There was no light pollution. He saw that, that black backdrop. That inky black backdrop. And then the, the stars blazing. And God saying, do you see that? That's how your descendants, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And Abraham believed him. And this is important for later in today's message. Abraham believed him. He believed that he would have that many descendants. Now I want to show you something in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and following. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. What did it say? For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, as a Christian, I know that. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Yes, absolutely. I am in Christ. Hallelujah, I am in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, and if you belong to Christ, 
then you are Abraham's descendants. When he looked up and saw that starry sky, and God said, as many as the stars are there, that's how many descendants you were going to have. Abraham didn't know it, but God was talking about us. If you are in Christ, I mean, that's the important part. I'm in Christ, but you are also a descendant of Abraham. You are what's called the true Israel. If you belong to Christ, verse 29, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. When God took Abraham outside, he wanted to talk about you. When God came in the vision and he took Abraham out into a dark night with the stars blazing, he wanted to talk to Abraham. God had a vision, you see. God had a vision, and in his vision, he saw a host of people who would be his children through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And now you are in that. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Paul could trace his ancestry physically all the way back to to Abraham and even farther. Paul could say that and he goes, I will not boast in that. May I only boast in the cross of Christ. Paul considered that airship that that God is talking about, this being in Christ, as, as bigger, much greater than being in Abraham. Now, I want you to follow me here. Stay real close with me. There are a couple of things that the Jews stumbled over. And we do too. One of the things they stumbled over was that the Messiah would have to suffer. They thought their Messiah would come. He would come with the sword. He would conquer the nations. They never saw the cross. When Jesus comes and he comes preaching about about a a victory and a reconciliation which is spiritual, when 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 he's preaching about a deliverance and a healing that is spiritual, they're like, wait, that's not what we signed up for. We're looking for a conquering king. And they stumbled over Christ because he was humble. In their own scriptures, it said, a bruised uh, reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not cast out. They they didn't quite see it, but there's something else they didn't see, and and, and I want to spend some time talking about this. See, when, when they hear God's promise to Abraham, here's what they hear. Abraham, you and, and your descendants are going to be my favorite. You're mine. Out of all of the world, you're my favorite. I have chosen you. But they miss the other half of the sentence where God says, and you will be a blessing to all of the nations. You see, when Jesus comes, he tells a parable about about two sons. You guys remember the prodigal son? But there's another son in the story the older brother. The older brother has no concern for the prodigal son. And for many of the Jewish people, they had no concern about being savior to about God saving the Gentiles. But all the time when God called Abraham, who was he looking at? The whole world. He was looking at you. When God called Abraham, he was looking at you, Carolina. He called Abraham so that you could be saved. Now, this is where we stumble. Because then Carolina could go, obviously I'm his favorite. This is where many of those in Christianity fail. They think that they're the end of his plan of salvation, and they're not the end. They think that what it was all about, have you ever heard this? Hey, it's not all about you. And I heard people go, well, of course it's all about me. I actually heard a man say, David, say that. Of course he came on the cross and he died for me. Yes, it is true that he did and he loves you. And if you were the only one to be saved, he would have died on the cross for you. But you're missing something. Would you look with me, please, to Luke chapter 15, 
verse 3. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? All right, let me just share a truth with you just for me. If I've got a hundred sheep and one gets lost, I'm not leaving the ninety-nine because I'm afraid I'm going to lose all of them. I don't know how shepherding works. I mean, I guess that you leave the 99. I don't know. But I'm just mathematically speaking, I would be saying, really sad, I lost that one. I don't want to lose another. But he says he leaves the 99 and he goes to find the one that is lost. In fact, he says uh, he leaves the 99 in the open pasture and goes after the one which is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Watch this. There's this dichotomy I want you to get that, that God can do this, but we can't very well. I think one of you had said something about my mother that when she talked to you or when you talked to her, she looked right into your eyes as if you were the only person in the world and you knew she was listening. When God does that, God does that with us too. As an individual, he looks right at you as if you're, you're it. He's looking right at you, but because he's infinite, he's also looking at your lost neighbor. The way that stars shine bright is when they are against a blackness. And there is a blackness out there. God had a vision. God takes Abraham to have a vision. But God had a vision from the creation of the world that there would be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you would be in it. He had a vision that you would shine against the black drop. What does Jesus say? Say, who lights a lamp and then puts it underneath of the bed? How silly. Do you think I'm that stupid, God would say? No, I lit the lamp and I put you in the blackness. Why? You're the older brother now. You see, you were the prodigal son. You were the younger brother one day. But when you came to Christ, you became the older brother now. So you're not the end. This is where we stumble. Christ came to save me. So that he could use me to save someone else. And they are the focus of his love. I am, I am the focus of his love. And at the same time that he looks right into my eyes. And his love is pouring upon me. I can tell he's looking at the guy next door. I remember in uh, the movie, the musical Fiddler on the Roof. There's a there's a little funny thing there. They're in they're in Russia, and they're living in this Jewish community, and they're all Jewish. And they're getting ready to have the wedding, and the federal government has decided that they need to punish the Jews a little bit to settle people down. And so they tell the local chief of police, "I need you to go in there and kind of rough them up." And the local police tells the hero of the story, I can't remember his name, hey, I've got to come and kind of mess things up. And so it's his daughter's wedding, and the horses are coming in, and the tables are being overthrown. And the next day, what's the guy's name? Does anybody remember the hero? What is it? Tivia. Thank you. Tivia's outside. He's kind of got his horse out there, and he's talking to God. You remember how Tivia talks to God? And he goes, I know that we're your chosen people. But do you think you could choose someone else for a while? <laughs> See, they, they were thinking that it was all about them. But it wasn't. He called Abraham so that he could call someone else. Look at this passage scripture in John chapter 10, verse 14 and following says, 
I am the good shepherd and I know my own. And my own know me. Even as the Father knows me. Look at the intimacy of this. I am the good shepherd. My own know me. I know my own. Even, even as the Father knows me. That's how, that's how close your relationship is to him. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep. Which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. The first message I want to give to you this morning is I want kind of in your mind that picture standing outside looking at an inky sky, black sky, and, and the stars of God the sons and daughters of God in that blackness shining. Now I want you to consider this. You guys know from science, there's a whole lot more emptiness out there than there are stars. Vast stretches that although the stars are numberless, it is still a remnant compared to all of the universe. It is the same way in the kingdom of God. Although the heirs of Abraham uh, are like salt shaken over the whole earth, we are still just a remnant in the vastness of humanity. And he called you so that he could call them. Let's continue on with our story in Genesis. Verse 6 is where I left off. He believed in the Lord and he reckoned to him as righteousness. In a manner of speaking, there is the salvation of Abraham that the New Testament speaks of more than once. He believed God and God counted it, put on his account righteousness by that faith. Verse 7, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these things to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcass and Abraham drove it away. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, it shall go, you shall go to your fathers in peace. And you shall be buried at a good old age. And then in the fourth generation they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Who? The three chieftains that he hung out with, Mamre and his two brothers. What race were they? They were Amorites. We saw that in the last chapter. Abraham, I'm not going to give you this land just yet. I'm going to wait 400 years. Why? I'm reaching out to those neighbors of yours. I'm going to work with them for 400 years, and then I'm going to bring your descendants in here, and you're going to wipe them out. But there's 400 years. Verse 17, it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and there be, behold, there appeared a smoking oven, a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river Euphrates, the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Kedamite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Rephium, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. You've probably heard many sermons on God going through that. The only thing I want to point out right now is God on that day established a promise with Abraham. What we read in the book of Galatians is, that we are heirs of Abraham and heirs of the promise. Is it the natural Palestine that we are heirs of? Anybody here got a piece of land in Palestine, maybe on the Gaza Strip or 
outside of Jerusalem? No. No. But Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe it also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I want you to notice that in the covenant that God makes with Abraham, it is twofold. One goes like this. You will have a multitude of descendants. Second, the land is yours. Those are the two aspects of the covenant. If he doesn't have the descendants, the covenant doesn't come true about the land because he wouldn't have any descendants to possess it. Both covenant, both parts of the covenant are in place. Abraham believed God. When God said to Abraham, you're going to have a bunch of kids, and those kids are going to come into this place like a flood, and they're going to take possession of it in the fourth generation. That is the promise Abraham believed that that was going to happen. I want you to get this. I just want to say this one more time before we move on. You've got to get this. Abraham believed that he was going to have a whole bunch of descendants, and he also believed that his descendants in the fourth generation would come in like a flood and possess the land. Everybody with you, with me on this? Right now, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of his life. Because what we were looking at was, we were looking at faith called, and then we saw faith stretched, faith grown through hard times. Between here and the end of the story, where that continues, that faith being grown and the faith being stretched, the whole thing with Ishmael, all, all of that stuff that takes place. Abraham is growing in his faith, but what I want us to look at now is faith perfected. Okay, so would you flip over with me? We're going to kind of fast forward the movie, pass chapter 16, pass chapter 17, pass chapter 18, pass chapter 19, pass chapter 20, pass chapter 21 to chapter 22, and we will see this, this faith of Abraham now perfected into something that is beautiful. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I tell you. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago I told you one of the largest words in the Bible is the word so? In Abraham's case, this happens so Abraham does this. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and split with burnt offering and rose and went to the place where God had told him. Now, if we are newspaper reporters dealing with this, we would be dealing with several aspects as we try to unfold the story. We would be deal do dealing with who, what, when, where, and how. Who? Isaac, your son, your only son, whom you love. That's who. What? Kill him. Offer him to me as a sacrifice. When? Right now. Where? The mountain I'm going to show you. The thing that we leave out is this. Why? I want to deal with that for a moment today. The why. Who, what, when, where, why? Now, from Abraham's point of view, the why is quite simple. I believe in God. I believe that he made a promise. I believe he promised that through Isaac, I would have a multitude of children. And I believe he promised this land. So I just obey. God commands, I obey. That's the why for Abraham. It's that simple. I believe in God. So he commands, I obey. Faith without obedience is dead. It's nothing but just talk. 
Faith is always accompanied by obedience or it is not faith. I'm not talking about earning your salvation by doing something. I'm talking about when you have a true faith, when you have come to Jesus Christ and you're trusting in God, he tells you to do stuff and you obey. Why do I obey? Because I want to, because it makes sense when I want to. These I don't, these I do. No, you obey because he's God. And what it does is it brings glory to him, particularly if he says, what I'd like you to do is jump off that cliff. Yes, sir. And off you go. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to walk on the water. Absolutely. What I'd like you to do, I'd like you to suffer. Yes, sir. The why for me is simple. He's God. The Bible says that unless we confess him as Lord, see, it's not just Savior, but Lord. Lord means what? Master, owner. He's my master. If he says it, I do it. Do I do it because I'm afraid of him? Actually, no. Why do I do it? Listen, eagles fly, dolphins swim, Christians obey. You try to get an eagle to swim, doesn't work. They just bubble. You try to throw a dolphin off the Empire State Board building, try to get him to fly, worse than a watermelon. You try to get a Christian to live without obeying his, his Savior, it's just as ugly. And yet that's what we do. I obey him when I think it's going to pay off. Why for Abraham was simple. My God, my friend, my shield, my reward, my covenant maker, my covenant keeper has told me to do it. It is my privilege, my pleasure to do whatever he says. In fact, the higher the cost, the greater the privilege. But I'm not dealing with Abraham's why. I get that. I want to know God's why. Why, God? Why did you do such a cruel thing to Abraham? That's where we want to go today. God's why. Bear with me for a minute. Let's just kind of run this through the process here. Okay, not only did he do it, he wrote it down. He wrote the whole thing down. Now, he wrote it down so that we could read it. If he wrote it down so that we could read it, then the why is for us. When he had that vision and he showed Abraham the inky sky and the stars blazing in it, are you all ready? He looked at those stars and said, I'm going to do something for you guys. Abraham, take your son. Sacrifice him. You see, the way that it's worded, where I had read it one place, it's so beautiful. It says, there has never been anything recorded in the Bible so cruelly asked of anyone Except one. Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a sacrifice. Who does that sound like? You see, if we think about what God, okay, God offered his son, okay, but they're eternal, I don't know how that works. I can't, I can't figure out how Jesus felt, how God felt. They're God. But I can certainly, as a father of three boys, imagine how Abraham felt. I was telling my wife just not too long ago, I looked at her, I just stopped in, in, in shock for a minute. I said, Grace, listen. We have given birth to and raised three sons, and none of them died. We need to stop right now and give God thanks. 
None of them were born with, with, with a disability. None of, them, none of them went to war and got blown up. See, as a father, I can... Abraham, take your... See, my heart is crying for Abraham. What? God, what are you doing? See, I may not be able to know how God feels, but I can certainly know how Abraham feels. And then suddenly, I can just be dropped by that and go, you're telling me that that's what you felt? Jesus is crucified in the same place that God told Abraham to take his son. In the Zion mountain chains, the, mid, the middle one is Moriah. The middle one is Moriah. Right there where Jerusalem is built. The why of it is this. God wants you to know how much he loves you. He wants you to know how much it hurt. You see, listen, it goes like this. Your sins caused you to have a need, and that need cried out to God, and the only thing that could satisfy it was the death of his son. And so God gave his son, his only son, whom he loves, like a lamb to the slaughter, right there in the place where he told Abraham to do it. How does that make you feel? How, how do you feel? Loved. And there are some people who have grown up in this world and have never felt love in their life. And when they hear this, they feel love for the first time. So you told me it makes you feel loved. How else does it make you feel? Humbled. Anything else? Does it make you feel any other way? Unworthy. Anything else? Pardon? Privileged. You're the called. And he's looking past you because he's calling. He died for the other guy, too. The Bible says he died for the sins of the world. That inky blackness that you've been privileged to be in. You're, you're there shining. And he's looking right into your eyes with this passage of scripture. He's looking right at you saying, do you see how much I love you? And at the same time, he's saying, so can you get it how much I love him? You want to be close to God, say, if you want to walk with God, if you want to be, have a close relationship with God, you've got to be involved in what he's involved with. And he's involved in salvation. Well, what do I do with this? Well, Lord, you said that I am an heir of your promise. That means I am saved, saved, saved. You said that, that you would never lose me. That means I'm done. I'm set. And I'm still here. When you made that promise, with Abraham, you had some bloody ground that you walked through. But when you made the promise to me, it was not with the blood of animals that you confirmed the covenant with me. It was with the blood of your son Jesus, hanging on a cross with it dripping on the ground. Abraham believed in, in that covenant that he saw of the dead animals, how much more can I believe in the covenant of the blood of your son, Jesus Christ? Therefore, I have nothing to fear. You are my shield and my very great reward. That means I can devote my entire life to being involved in what you're involved in, the salvation of lost people. Command me, Lord. Never will I say no. Command me that I might then have the privilege in view of God's mercy. Let us offer our bodies as living sacrifices. So you're done. They're not. 
Here's the other thing. He says, when one of them comes to him, all of heaven rejoices. What do you get the guy for Christmas that's got everything? Right? But what, what do you buy the guy? The, the guy that's got everything, what do you buy him? Psalms uh, chapter uh, 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord and everything it contains. The world and those who dwell in it. What can I buy him? Every time you tell somebody about Jesus, he goes, hey, Gabriel, look at that. That's my son. He's on the field. They just gave him the ball. Look at that. Look, he threw that block. Did you see that? See him make that move? That's my son. Send the cheerleaders out. Yay, hurrah. Somebody accepts Christ. Touchdown! And since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let's run the race. Run the race, Paul says, that has been set out for me. It's not the same with you. So, Thursday, I was in my garage. Friday. Friday, I was in my garage working on the train for the children's ministry. I'd been out there all day. I'd been looking at my neighborhood going, God, these hips of mine, I can't even walk. I can't prayer walk anymore. I, I can get to that little corner. I can't go any further. I, it's cold weather now. They're not out much. I can't, I can't spend any time with them. All day, I sat in the garage with the door open, working on the train. And I had my little earphones in, and I'm totally in in engrossed in painting the, the, the spokes on the wheels. And I hear a voice, I, and, and it's my neighbor going, he's trying to get my attention because i I got the earphones on. And he sat down, and we were talking. He came to borrow a tool. The next thing I know, there's not two people in the garage. There's three. Me and my neighbor and the Holy Spirit of God. And the conversation turns from tools to God's work. And God just began to talk to him. And he says to me at the end of the conversation, the sun had gone down, and I mean, it got cold out there. Neither one of us had a coat. I was chilled to the bone. He was too, but the conversation was so sweet. Neither one of us wanted to leave. And he said to me, I know a whole lot of people that have lost their way, and they can't find it in church. I said, well, bring them to my garage. A whole lot of people, he said, Christians who have just lost their way, but they can't find it in church. He didn't even know that the two of us sitting there together was church. <laughs> and then yesterday he said, you know that time you hosted everybody over in your driveway? He said, in January, I think I want to have everybody over to my house. Will you help me? Man. I want you to, as we get ready to go share this meal, here's the things I want you to just kind of have in your bank, in your knower. I'm going to ask the worship team to come right now, too. The things I want you to have in your knower. Number one, when God showed Abraham a vision, he had a vision. And you were in it, a star shining against the blackness. Number two, eagles fly, dolphins swim, and Christians obey. That's our medium. It's where we live. Number three, 
when you read the story about Abraham and you know that as he obeyed, how much it cost him, I want you to remember the why of it. It was God himself talking to you today saying this, it cost me that much to meet your need for salvation. And I want you to feel loved. I want you to feel his love. But make sure you don't stumble and let it in there. He loves you and he calls you, but he loves others as well.